In today's video, we're going to discuss a classic theorem from number theory. It is called Fermat's Little Theorem. And we're going to give an explanation as to why it actually holds in the first place. So stay tuned to this video for the reveal for Fermat's Little Theorem. Hey, welcome to today's video. I'm Prof. Omar. This channel is dedicated to undergraduate mathematics theorems and problems for your journey through the undergraduate and to prepare you for the journey beyond. If this resonates with you and it's your first time on the channel, definitely subscribe and click the bell for notifications on future videos. And if you're already a subscriber, thanks for coming back. So today I want to talk about this classic theorem in number theory called Fermat's Little Theorem. And it states the following. If P is a prime number and A is any integer, then A to the P minus A is a multiple of P regardless of what A is. So we're going to give a complete explanation as to why this is true. That's the focus of the video. I do want to make one comment though. Notice that if A actually is already a multiple of P, so let's say A is P times K, then this expression is PK to the P minus PK. And here, this will be P to the P, K to the P minus P times K. And so we'll get a factor of P automatically with uh, the other factor being P to the P minus one times K to the P minus K. So we'll eliminate the possibility of A being a multiple of P because we've already established that this will be a multiple of P as a consequence. So we've now reduced the problem to the statement that if A is not a multiple of P, then A to the P minus A is a multiple of P. Instead of giving like a general proof, what I want to do is motivate the idea which extends naturally to the general prime case with p equals 7. So we get an intuition of what's going on. Okay, so the idea behind the proof is the following, is to write down all numbers between 1 and p minus 1. So we'll write down the six numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, now we're given this random number a that's not a multiple of p. What we'll do is multiply all of these elements by that number. So we'll get a, 2a, 3a, 4a, 5a, and 6a. Okay, so we have two lists of numbers here. Notice this first list, if we divide each of these numbers by seven, they are their own remainders because they're small numbers. So we get every single possible remainder in this list when we divide by 7, except for 0. Okay, since a is not a multiple of 7, none of these numbers are a multiple of 7 either. They don't have a factor of 7 in them at all. So what I want to do is investigate what happens when we divide these numbers by 7. What are the remainders that we can possibly get? Well, let's say two of these had the same remainder, like let's say 2a and 5a had the same remainder when divided by 7. If these two have the same remainder when divided by 7, then their difference is a multiple, would have to be a multiple of 7. Right? For example, if you have two numbers like uh, 16, which has a remainder of 2 when divided by 7, and another number that has a remainder of 2 when divided by 7, like 44, the difference between these two is 28, and that is a multiple of 7. So suppose, for example, these two left the same remainder when divided by 7. Then their difference would be a multiple of 7, which would mean 3a is a multiple of 7, but 3a isn't a multiple of 7 because a is not a multiple of 7, and 3 is not a common factor with 7 at all. Okay, so this is going to be true in general. Any pair of these we can represent as ma and na, where we can make one without loss of generality greater than the other, and they're all between one and six. So if they left the same remainder when you divide by seven, their difference would be divisible by seven, which would mean m minus n times a is divisible by seven. But this thing has no multiple of seven in it, and this number is between 6 and 1, because the difference of two numbers between 6 and 1 is actually not, no bigger than 5. But that doesn't matter. The point is it's too small to be a multiple, to have a factor of 7 in it. Okay, so that means that all of these numbers 
leave different remainders when we divide by six, by seven. But the possible remainders that they could possibly even leave in the first place are the numbers one, two, three, four, five, and six, because none of them is divisible by seven. So we have six numbers, each of which leave a different remainder when divided by seven, none of which leaves a zero remainder. That means if we were to list the remainders out, they'd have to be a rearrangement of these six numbers, because these are six numbers between one and six, and they're all different. So it might be something like six, five, one, two, three, and four, or something different. Let's actually see an example of this with actual numbers. So for example, if A was, let's say three, then these numbers would be three, six, nine, 12, 15, and 18, and the remainders we get when we divide by seven are three, six, two, five, one, and four. Indeed, this is a rearrangement of this list right over here. Okay, so why is something like that helpful? Well, now if we think about the product of all of these numbers, that will give us an a, a factor of a to the p minus one. There's six copies of a in here. And so that's kind of close to this expression that we have right over here. Okay, but if we take the product of these numbers, one of them looks like seven times something plus one, one of them looks like seven times something plus two, et cetera, up to seven times something plus six because we get all possible remainders when dividing by seven. <clears throat> if you expand this out as a binomial, you notice that every single term is gonna have a factor of seven in it, except for this last term, which is the product of one, two, three, four, five, and six. So this number, when divided by seven, has the same remainder as this when divided by seven. Now this was a representation of the product of these things. So that means that when you take the product of these things, it leaves the same remainder when you divide by seven as the product of these things. Okay, if the product of these things leaves the same remainder when you divide by seven as the product of these things, that means that their difference is divisible by seven. So, the difference of these two things is a multiple of seven itself. This difference is, has a common factor of one times two times three times four times five times six. Here, we get an a to the sixth, and then here we get a factor of one. So this number right over here has to be a multiple of seven. But we don't see any sevens involved in this piece of the product. So that means that this number here is a multiple of seven. Okay, now our goal was to prove that a to the seven minus a is a multiple of seven. Luckily this thing is a times this. So if this is a multiple of seven, then this thing has to be a multiple of seven because this is a multiple of this. Okay, very cool. So an interesting proof for this fact, um, one of the things that I want to mention here is if you were to prove this in general, we'd have a similar argument where we replace seven by a random prime p. And everything sort of works out the same. We established that the numbers a, 2a, uh, 2a, 3a, 4a, up to p minus 1 times a all leave different remainders when we divide by p, um, and none of them leave a remainder of 0. Then we take the product of all these. Here we'd get the product of p minus 1 copies of a and a p minus 1 factorial instead of a 6 factorial for the general case, and the factoring would work out to be um, very, very similar.
Now, the technique of coming up with this idea of multiplying by a and looking at the fact that all these things are all different when divisible by when looking at divisibility by seven is something that actually is inherited from ideas in what's called group theory. So there is a nice way to establish Fermat's little theorem with a bit more of an advanced algebraic framework, which one learns in an abstract algebra course when you talk about the concept of a group. And in that concept, it is natural to consider things like taking a number and taking products of some sort that give you all possible um, remainders when dividing by a particular number. Cool, so there you have it, an actual concrete reason why Fermat's little theorem works in general. So I hope you liked today's video. If you did, click the like button. If you wanna see more videos like this, definitely subscribe to the channel and click the bell for notifications on future videos.